Okay, so here's a picture explaining about cast pedaling, which we had talked about, about previously. Uh, we said when we pedal a cast, uh, it's done uh, whenever the patient has uh, signs of uh, irritation uh, of the skin because of the uh, rough cast edges. And we do the pedaling by overlapping waterproof tape around the cast edges. So it's showing you there how to pedal a cast, and that is the example. Here we have an example of what we talked about with um, cast bracing. This is this happens to be a long leg cast brace, and you can see the hinge there around uh, the knee. And remember, one of the things we talked about with the cast bracing, one of the problems associated with it is edema to the knee. So we would uh, instruct the patient to elevate their leg when sitting to promote venous returned. So this is an example of long leg cast braces. All right, so now we're going to be getting into non-surgical interventions for musculoskeletal disorders. And this is a lot of very important information. NCLEX loves to ask questions about traction. Okay, so you've got to know your information uh, and some of it that we already talked about. Making sure when your patient is in traction that the ropes uh, that are connected to the weights are uh, hanging freely at the end of the bed. The ropes are not uh, twisted and tangled and they are hanging freely. So that's just some of the uh, previous information that we talked about concerning traction. Very importantly, uh, you better know the purposes of traction. Make sure that you write these down and you better make sure that you know these. So first off, let's talk about what traction is. All traction is, is the process of putting an extremity a bone or a group of muscles under tension by means of weights and pulleys. And why do we do that? What is the purpose of uh, putting a bone under tension by the means of weights and pulleys? Well, it's we do this uh, for several reasons, okay? And make sure you write these down and you know these. These are the following uh, purposes of traction. So number one, the first purpose of traction to align and stabilize fractures, okay? So to align and stabilize fractures, that's number one. So these are the purposes of traction. Number one, align and stabilize fractures. Number two, to relieve pressure on nerves, okay? So to relieve pressure on nerves, that is number two. Number three, to maintain correct positioning. So again, to maintain correct positioning, that is number three. Number four, to prevent deformities. To prevent deformities. Number five, to relieve muscle spasms. Okay, number five is to relieve muscle spasms. And then add this one because it is not in your book. It's not in your book. Number six is immobilization. Okay, so that's another purpose of traction, immobilization. Okay, so to recap the purposes of traction. Number one, to align and stabilize fractures. Number two, to relieve pressure on nerves. Number three, to maintain correct positioning. Number four, to prevent deformities. Number five, to relieve muscle spasms. And then number six, uh, immobilization and add that to your notes. Those are the purposes of traction and you need to add immobilization to your notes. So again, traction, we're just, uh, it's just a process of putting an extremity, a bone, or a group of muscles under tension and we do that by weights and pulleys. Now are, there are two types of traction. You have skeletal traction and you have skin traction. Uh, traction, uh, one thing you need to know about traction in general is that traction can be intermittent or it can be continuous. So a person could be intermittently on traction where they're uh, connected to traction so many hours out of the day, uh, or it can be continually where they're under uh, continuous traction all day long. Now to stabilize a fracture, continuous traction is applied and shouldn't be disconnected. Okay, unless it's ordered by the physician. So you never run in there as a nurse and disconnect traction. 
uh, cervical and pelvic traction uh, can be intermittent. So again, cervical and pelvic traction can be intermittent. So we're going to focus right now on skeletal traction and talk uh, in depth about skeletal traction. Now, skeletal traction is also known as balanced suspension skeletal traction. And you have a picture of this in your book. When you flip through your pages, there is a picture on the bottom of the page and it shows you figure A and figure B and it's called balanced suspension skeletal traction to the femur. Okay? And it's showing you a picture in uh, the A, in the picture A. In picture B, you have a tibial pin traction and they use a Steinman pin, okay, because they're treating a, a distal uh, femoral fracture. So those are two pictures in your book. that are black and white pictures of skeletal traction. Now normally uh, when we think about skeletal traction uh, it is used for a longer time frame and it uses heavier weights than skin traction. So one thing that differentiates skeletal from skin traction is the fact that with skeletal traction it is done for a longer period of time and it uses heavier weights than skin traction. Uh, when we think about skeletal traction, it is applied directly to the bone with wires and surgical pins through the bone, uh, distal to the fracture site with local or general anesthesia used. The pins protrude through the skin on both sides of the extremity and then the traction is applied with weights attached to a rope. Okay? Uh, it's used for fractures of the femur, the tibia, the humerus, uh, cervical spine, different things like that. So that is skeletal traction. And one thing we have to think about with skeletal traction is also remember you, all, you always have to watch for the loosening of the pins. So you have to watch that. You also have to clean them properly with whatever agent is ordered for you to cleanse them with. Uh, skin traction. Uh, skin traction is used for a shorter uh, time duration. It uses lighter weights. It's applied directly to the skin using an adherent or uh, some sort of plastic material and it's attached to the skin below the fracture site uh, with the pull exerted on the limbs. Some different examples when we think about skin traction are Buck's traction, Russell's traction, and what we call Bryant's traction. And your book does not talk about Bryant's traction but I am going to, so make sure you get ready to take down some extra notes in reference to Bryant's traction. Okay, so first off, we're going to talk about Buck's traction. And you have pictures of these in your book. So flip through your book, and you have three pictures uh, on the top of the page labeled A, B, and C. Okay, so when you're thinking about Buck's traction, when you're looking at those three different pictures, you can see that caption C is an example of Buck's traction, and then B is indicative of Russell's traction. And I have placed a picture uh, following these slides of what Bryant's traction looks like. Okay, so make sure you take a look at that. All right, so focusing on Buck's traction right now, this is a temporary measure to provide support uh, and comfort to a fractured extremity. Uh, while we're awaiting more definitive treatment like uh, surgery, for example. They might be waiting to uh, stabilize this fracture uh, while they're waiting on a, a decision to be made about a surgical procedure. Now the traction uh, is in a horizontal plane and it is used to maintain reduction of hip fractures prior to surgery. It also can be used to treat muscle spasms and minor fractures of the lower spine. And some very, very important, very important information associated with traction is to make sure that the patient's feet never touch the foot of the bed. When their feet touches the foot of the bed, this eliminates the pull of the traction of that affected extremity. So you always make sure that the patient's feet never touch the foot of the bed. That eliminates the pull of the traction. Okay, that counter traction is eliminated when the patient's feet touch the foot of the bed. So make sure you pay attention to that and make sure they haven't slid down and their feet are touching the foot of the bed. 
Also, something very important for you to remember also, uh, if this is not in your book, make sure you write it down. Make sure the patient uses the trapeze bar. Okay, you know the trapeze bar that hangs over top of the bed. You have uh, pictures of trapeze bars. If you do not know what they are in relation to a hospital bed, look it up. So make sure the patient uses the trapeze bar to lift themselves up to decrease pressure, okay? Because when they're lying in bed for long periods of time, you have an increased chance that that patient, when they're immobile like that, laying in traction, that they're gonna have breakdown, okay, to the coccyx area. So you have to pay attention to that. So make sure you teach your patient to use that trapeze bar to lift up, to relieve pressure on, the, on that area. Okay, that also provides a time that you can provide some good skin care and do your skin assessment. Okay, because we've got to be constant, constantly looking for skin breakdown due to their immobility. So again, the trapeze bar, have them lift up on it. That helps to relieve pressure on pressure points, and it provides a time for the nurse to uh, provide some good skin care and do a good skin assessment. Okay, so I've given you some very important information about the feet never touching the foot of the bed, using the trapeze bar, Make sure the patient's using it to relieve pressure points and so you, the nurse, can provide good skin care and do a skin assessment. Now we're moving on to Russell's traction. And again, this is a type of skin traction. You have to know which uh, types of traction are considered skin traction. So you better know skin traction is Bucks, Russell's, and Bryant's. Now, with Russell's traction, this is kind of a similar setup to Buck's traction. If you look in your picture in your book, you can see they kind of look almost almost uh, identical. Not exactly, but they resemble each other. So with Russell's traction, it is similar to Buck's with the addition of a knee sling, okay, to provide support. So you see the addition there of that knee sling. It is just a knee sling and it's providing support. It allows for more movement in the bed when a patient is in Russell's traction. And it also allows for flexion of the knee joint. Uh, it is commonly used when we think about uh, Russell's traction, it's commonly used with the treatment of uh, hip fractures and knee fractures. Again, some very important information about traction. Always make sure that the weights hang freely. Okay, I make sure that the weights are hanging freely at the end of the bed. Okay to provide for that counter traction. Okay, counter traction, when we think about counter traction, counter traction is a force acting in the opposite direction. Okay, so always make sure your weights at the end of the bed are hanging freely, the ropes are not tangled, the ropes are not frayed. Okay, they're in good condition, they're hanging freely, and we have to make sure that they are hanging freely so in order for counter traction to be effective. And again, counter traction is a force acting in the opposite direction. And again, when the weights are hanging off the end of the bed and it's connected to that pulley, it is a pulling force in the opposite direction, okay? Now we're gonna talk about Bryant's traction. Okay, with Bryant's traction, this is an uh, orthopedic mechanism that immobilizes the bilateral lower extremities. So we have the immobilization of the bilateral lower extremities to treat uh, femur fractures or to correct a congenital hip dislocation. Okay, congenital means you were born with it. Okay, so we see this used a lot of, uh, a lot of the time in uh, small children. So if they were born with a congenital hip dislocation, you would see a child in Bryant's traction. And you will see that slide as you go uh, through these notes. So uh, again, Bryant's traction used a lot with children. So what would you think about with children as far as uh, a child having to lay in traction up to 16 to 20 hours a day? Okay, which is typical with Bryant's traction. Uh, Think about this, children need to have access to toys, okay, and their favorite things to help divert their attention. Now, can you imagine a, a two-year-old, a toddler, somebody in, a child in the toddler age realm who has to lay in traction for up to 16 to 20 hours per day? Uh, 
that's not going to work out real well unless they have access to a lot of things to divert their attention, like their favorite toys. Okay, so keep that in mind with Bryant's traction. Now, some nursing interventions. We need to maintain proper body alignment and carefully assess the traction equipment. Make sure the pulleys uh, remain off of the floor. So that pulley system at the end of the bed should never be lying on the floor. So the pulleys must remain off of the floor. Assess your pin sites. Apply the prescribed agents using a sterile cotton tipped applicator. Again, look for signs and symptoms of infection. Assess for the loosening of pins. Okay, antibiotic ointments may be applied at the pin sites. Just follow your doctor's orders. Okay, now let's take a look at some nursing interventions for the patient in traction. So you've got a blue box that says nursing interventions for the patient in traction. This has a whole lot of very important information in it. All right, so the first bullet there you see, maintain the patient's body in proper alignment. The force or pull on the extremities should be in alignment with the long axis of the bone. Next, ensure the weights hang freely. There is a ton of important information in this box and you better make sure you're familiar with it. Uh, so ensure the weights are hanging freely from the bed and they are never removed without an order. Question patients as to their understanding of the purpose of traction and assess their ability to use a trapeze bar for self-movement. Elevate the foot of the bed to help prevent the patient from sliding down toward the foot of the bed. Again, the feet should never touch the foot of the bed, okay, because that effectively does away with the counter traction, and we do not want that. So in order for that traction to be effective, feet do not touch the foot of the bed because it does away with the counter traction. Uh, next here we see observe the condition of the traction cords, making sure that they are not weakened or frayed. All knots used on the rope or cord are to be square knots. And I have a picture in one of my slides on here that shows you what a square knot looks like that has actually been on people's boards before. Center the ropes on the traction pulley. Assess, document, and report neurovascular impairment. Ensure that the weight used is the correct weight as ordered. Carefully observe the skin for signs of impairment. Use sheepskin heel protectors and bed pads to reduce impairment. If skeletal traction is used, assess the pin site for signs of infection. Cleanse the pin site every eight hours with hydrogen peroxide or normal saline as ordered. Assess the distal pulses bilaterally for circulatory integrity. And then inspect for loss of sensation, okay, in the dorsal area of the foot with weakness and inversion of the foot. So it's inside surface turned outward, okay. So you're watching for things like that, loss of sensation. That would be part of your neurovascular assessment. Okay, so like I said, in that box is some extremely important information for you to know. Lots of important information in addition to what I've already told you about traction. So very, very important. Here we have a picture of Bryant's traction, like I, I told you the book kind of skips over it. And you can see this little one laying here uh, in her Bryant's <laughs> traction. So she's laying there, uh, hopefully watching a favorite cartoon or something. Uh, again, she is going to need some major diversional activities because of her age. So she is probably suffering from some sort of congenital hip dislocation. Congenital again means, you know, we were born with it. So this is an example of Bryant's traction for you to see. Here is an example of a square knot, what we just talked about, okay? We said with traction, all knots used on the rope or cord are to be square knots. And this is an example of a square knot for you to see. All right, so talking about some orthopedic devices, your book talks about different types of frames that are used in the turning and positioning of patients who have orthopedic injuries.
we are not going to uh, delve into these different types of orthopedic devices in depth. We're just going to briefly go over them. If you ever wish to read about them, by all means, uh, when you're bored, get back in there and read all about them. But uh, we're just briefly going to talk about uh, a few of them just by listing them. So your book talks about Balk uh, Balkan frames, uh, Bradford frames, striker uh, beds, circoelectric beds, roto rest beds. Okay. So those are some of the beds uh, that are used uh, when you're trying to position patients who have orthopedic injuries. So again, I am not going to test you on any of those beds whatsoever. So moving on to splints, crutches, and braces. When we think about splints, crutches, and braces, these are used uh, to um, immobilize and assist with ambulation. Now, anytime you think about these devices, safety is a top priority with these ambulatory devices. So safety is always going to be your top priority, especially when you have patients uh, who have splints on, braces, they're utilizing crutches. You know, these patients are very high risk for falls. So safety is my priority. The nurse must understand the procedure for proper application when you're talking about uh, putting splints and braces on, okay? So you have to think about those things. Uh, encourage the patient to perform uh, push-ups by pressing their hands against the mattress and lifting uh, their upper body, you know, because we want to make sure we increase and keep that muscle strength of the upper body. It can't be weak or they're not going to be able to utilize crutches. Uh, there's different types of crutch walking um, and that depends on the number of points making contact with the floor. And most crutch walking is taught by physical therapy, uh, and the nurse uh, really just monitors the progress of the patient. Now, older patients are likely to use canes for walking. Uh, they also use it for you know, balance purposes and support. Now, very importantly, you have to know how a patient should be properly using a cane. So if you see as a nurse a patient does not know how to use their cane appropriately, you know how to teach them the proper way to use it to prevent falls. So the patient should hold the cane in the opposite hand of the affected extremity. So if my affected extremity, let's say my uh, right lower leg is the problem, the cane should be held in the opposite hand. So if my problem is my right lower extremity, I should be holding the cane in my left hand. Okay, so the patient should hold the cane in the opposite hand of the affected extremity. And they should advance the cane at the same time as the affected leg moves forward. So I should be advancing that cane the same time as I'm advancing my right leg that has the problem. Okay, so you need to make sure you understand how patients should properly utilize a cane. Make sure that the canes have a, a rubber tip on the bottom, you know, because that's going to prevent slipping and possible uh, injury from falling. Now, something very, very, very important that you better make sure you remember is that with a cane, you should, the patient should be keeping two points of support on the floor, okay? So with a cane, make sure they keep two points of support on the floor, okay, at all times with the affected extremity. So with a cane, keep two points of support on the floor with the affected extremity. So at no time should the affected extremity be the only point of contact on the floor. So with a cane, keep two points of support on the floor with the affected extremity. That is extremely important to remember. Now we also have devices called, uh, when we think about walkers, okay, walkers also aid in maintaining our patient's uh, sense of balance. We have different types of uh, walkers. We have, uh, your book shows a picture of a rollabout walker. So a rollabout walker, uh, that is used for below the knee injuries, uh, such as fractures of the tibia, the fibula, the ankle, the foot, and it allows the patient to distribute their weight evenly by placing the knee of the affected leg on the knee pad and then 
they propel, okay, and, and then they propel the device with the unaffected leg. So th there's a picture of that in your book. It shows a lady there, and she's on her little rollabout walker. So that is very uh, handy for patients to utilize. While you are looking at the picture of the lady with her rollabout, uh, on the opposite page you have a picture of a therapist or a nurse. I don't know what she is. She's standing there with uh, a patient who has crutches. So we need to read the caption underneath that picture. So with this figure, we see assisting the patient with crutch walking. Note how the therapist guards the patient, okay, she's guarding the patient in case of a fall, okay, and how the patient's elbows are at no more than 30 degrees of flexion. So that is some very important information right there. And add to that, underneath that picture, add the following. So the arms and elbows should not be straight when using crutches. That is a no-no, okay? So you can see with the no more than 30 degree flexion, that is the correct way to use crutches. The patient should not have their arms straight when using crutches. So the arms and elbows should not be straight when using crutches. If the arms and elbows are straight and they look like uh, a robot when they are using crutches, that is not the correct way to use crutches. So just look at that picture right there and you can note right there how the patient's elbows are at no more than 30 degrees of flexion and that is the correct way to use crutches. The arms and elbows should not be straight when using the crutches. And remember about the crutch paralysis. They should not be bearing all of their weight underneath the uh, armpits and the axillae there. Because remember, they can get crutch paralysis. Remember, we talked about that, and that's very important for you to remember. Okay, so let's look at some safety alerts on crutch safety. It's in a red box. You might have to turn the page back. Uh, this is located under the pictures for Russell's and Buck's traction. It's a red box. It says safety alert, and we're talking about crutch safety. This has some very important information. You better make sure you know the information from this box. So crutch safety involves proper measurement with weight on the hands and not the axillae to avoid nerve and blood vessel damage in the axillary region. So again, that brachial plexus nerve damage that we already talked about, AKA crutch paralysis, that is the reason why they should not be bearing the weight under the armpits, okay? It should not be, they should not be bearing their weight on the axillae. The weight should be on their hands. Make sure you remember that because it can lead to that brachial plexus nerve damage. And they'll be able, uh, their, arm will, their arms will be permanently damaged from this, like we already talked about. Make sure they leave a two inch width between the axillary fold and the arm piece on the crutches. So there should be a two inch width between the axillary fold and that arm piece on the top of the crutches. So two inches in between there. That has been on people's boards before. Rubber tips on the ends of the crutches to prevent slipping or slippage. Adequate muscle strength in the upper extremities to support the patient's weight. Again, add to this, arms and elbows should not be straight. So add to that box what we already talked about. The arms and elbows should not be straight. Okay, so turn, we've got another uh, safety alert. Turn back under the cap of our picture with the lady with the rollabout walker and we have a safety alert about preventing musculoskeletal trauma that we're gonna talk about. This is, again, very important information here. All right, so teach patients and community members to take appropriate safety precautions to prevent injuries while at home, work, when driving, or when participating in sports. Be a vocal advocate for personal actions known to reduce injuries, such as regularly using seat belts, driving within the posted speed limits, stretching before exercising, 
using protective athletic equipment such as helmets, uh, knee, wrist, and elbow pads, and not combining drinking and driving, or drugs and driving. Uh, encourage older adults to participate in moderate exercise to aid in the maintenance of muscle strength and balance. Again, that's safety to prevent falls. This next bullet here is extremely important. This has actually, again, been on NCLEX. To reduce falls, examine the older adult's living environment to rule out the use of scatter rugs. There's those dastardly scatter rugs we've already talked about that can, that can uh, cause our elderly, uh, our elderly, our older adults to have falls in their homes. So evaluate that and make sure they are not using those scatter rugs. That, in, that increases their fall risk. To ensure adequate footwear and lighting and to clear paths to bathrooms for nighttime use. That's all important there for our older adults in their living environment. Make sure you familiarize yourself with that. Stress the importance of adequate calcium and vitamin D intake. Okay, so all of those things are very important. So make sure you read your safety alert boxes and that nursing interventions for the patient and traction. I have given you a multitude of important information that I promise you, you will see it again. Okay, so we're going to be talking about traumatic injuries. We're going to be focusing on contusions, sprains, whiplash, ankle sprains, also known as a twisted ankle, strains, dislocations, and airbag injuries. First off, we're going to talk about um, the first five traumatic injuries, and first we're going to go over some basic terminology, and then we will uh, go into some deeper information on each injury. So first off, let's define a contusion. A contusion is just a bruise. It's a type of hematoma. So you have a blow or blunt force that causes some uh, local bleeding under the skin. Uh, sprains, the definition to a sprain is a wrenching or hyperextension of a joint. You can have the tearing of the capsule and ligaments associated with sprains. Whiplash, this is an injury at the cervical spine caused by hyperextension and flexion. Sometimes you hear whiplash um, called uh, a cervical disc syndrome. So you might hear that those terms can be used interchangeably. Ankle sprains are next, and this is a wrenching or twisting of the foot and ankle. So you're twisting the joint. And again, this is also known as a twisted ankle. So uh, the last one we'll talk about um, terminology-wise um, are strains. Strains are microscopic muscle tears. Okay, and um, that's due to a result of overstretching the muscles and tendons. So that is a strain, and you have microscopic muscle tears. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about a contusion. Contusions, uh, their severity depends on the part of the body that's affected. For instance, a contusion of the brain is much more serious than a contusion to the arm or the leg. Uh, large areas can be affected by soft tissue bleeding, and when there is low reabsorption of that blood, uh, the patient has a high risk of developing cellulitis. So that's where they have that uh, infection or inflammation of the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, what is my medical management for contusions? Well, ice or cold compresses, that's important. Uh, elevating the extremity to decrease edema and pain, that's important. Again, you would not want to use warmth because warmth promotes or heat promotes vasodilation and that would end up causing even more bleeding. Um, again, that's why you're using the ice or the cold compresses because that promotes vasoconstriction and decreases uh, bleeding tendencies. The next thing we're going to talk about uh, with traumatic injuries are sprains. So sprains can involve bleeding into a joint. And anytime you hear the term uh, hemarthrosis, that means bleeding into a joint. Some uh, common areas for sprains include the knees, uh, ankles, the cervical spine. Uh, medical management is extremely important with sprains, and you better make sure that you remember this. With medical management, we're going to use the acronym RICE, R-I-C-E. R stands for rest. I stands for ice, C is for compression, and E is for elevation. So make sure you remember that acronym RICE for your medical management of sprains. And it's rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Again, we would not want to use heat 
because that um, causes vasodilation and you have more bleeding. Whiplash is next. This is a type of injury uh, that's due to sudden acceleration and deceleration. When you think about whiplash, we think about rear end car collisions. Uh, cervical fractures are something you have to always make sure that you think about with whiplash patients. Cervical fractures can coincide with whiplash, so always keep that in mind. They can have a cervical injury due to the whiplash. Now, during my assessment subjectively with whiplash, the patient's going to complain of pain, usually in the cervical area first, but it can uh, radiate down the arm to the fingers. Uh, it also increases with cervical motion. The pain uh, increases sharply whenever the patient coughs or sneezes or uh, does anything like that. They can also suffer from paresthesia. We know that means numbness and tingling. Uh, headaches can occur, blurred vision, weakened hand grip, things like that. Objectively, uh, we're going to note any edema to the cervical spine area, uh, tightening of muscles, we're going to report to the uh, healthcare provider stat if the patient has hypertension, okay, with a widened pulse pressure and bradycardia. That is, those are indicators of increased intracranial pressure. Again, so you better make sure you remember that. These are, these, this is what we're looking for with increased intracranial pressure. So we have hypertension, okay, hypertension with a widened pulse pressure. And remember, we talked about this in the surgical chapter. How you figure up um, your pulse pressure is that you simply subtract your diastolic value from your systolic value of the blood pressure. Remember, we said typically uh, normal blood pressure is usually 120 over 80. So therefore, subtracting 80 from 120 gives you 40. And 40 to 60 is a normal pulse pressure. So if we have a widened pulse pressure, Okay, when, when we think about increased intracranial pressure, this causes a rise in systolic pressure. So we might see a blood pressure with a widened pulse pressure. We may see a reading of, let's say, 180 over um, 80. So 180 over 80. So when we subtract that, that's a pulse. When we subtract 80 from 180, that gives us a pulse pressure of 100. So that is far greater than the normal 40 to 60. So we're watching for that widened pulse pressure. We're watching for bradycardia, so the pulse starts to go down. Uh, and then again, these things are telling us that this patient may have increased intracranial pressure. And we will delve into this in much more depth when we get to the neuro chapter. So if you learn it now, you'll know it when we go over it in neuro. Make sure you do your neuro assessments every 15 to 30 minutes to rule out increased intracranial pressure. Diagnostic tests, they're gonna do physical exams, x-rays, medical management. Symptoms typically uh, recur with whiplash. So analgesics, muscle relaxants, sometimes people have to uh, have intermittent cervical traction and surgery sometimes. Nursing interventions. Immobilize the cervical vertebrae. Again, why are we doing that? Because whiplash and cervical fractures coincide sometimes. So immobilization of the cervical vertebrae is going to be very important. And should you ever remove a cervical collar without checking your x-ray results first, even if a physician tells you to do so? No, a physician can make a mistake. You never take off a cervical collar that's immobilizing the vertebrae without first checking x-ray results and making sure that they are medically cleared and they have no cervical injury. So always check first before you run and take off someone's cervical collar. Um, also with our nursing interventions, we need to make sure that we um, decrease irritation and provide rest for the traumatized area. Again, those cervical collars can be irritating. So uh, if they have on that neck brace, make sure you inspect their skin around the neck and the chin area for excoriation. All right, moving on to ankle sprains, AKA twisted ankle. This is due to the wrenching and the twisting of the foot and ankle. Our clinical manifestations, we see edema, muscle spasms, pain, okay, with passive motion in the joint. During my assessment subjectively, I'm gonna 
uh, have my patient tell me about their pain or do they have tenderness? Does it intensify with movement? Objectively, I can see the edema. The, I can see the limitations in movement and the functioning of the joint. I may see uh, bruising in the soft tissue of the ankle. Diagnostic tests, they're going to do x-rays. Medical management for severe sprains, sometimes surgery is necessary. Okay, torn ligaments um, have to be sutured, so they're going to have to undergo surgery. If it's torn from the bone, uh, they have to drill these small holes to reattach them uh, to the medial malleolus. Okay, so surgery sometimes is necessary. Um, nursing interventions, the only nursing intervention I want you to make sure that you remember for ankle sprains is ICE. ICE for the first 48 to 72 hours and use your acronym RICE that we already talked about. So rest, ICE, compression, elevation, your acronym RICE. So ICE definitely for the first 48 to 72 hours. Now you have a safety alert located in your book in red. It talks about strains and sprains. Uh, be sure and read that and understand. Um, it says a strain and a sprain are not the same. Strains are produced by minute muscle tears and overstretching of tendons, whereas sprains are caused by a twisting of the joint. So make sure you understand the differentiation between strains and sprains. Okay, so again, uh, the nursing intervention, the medical management, uh, we're going to use that acronym of RICE. And the ICE is going to be placed on the area for the first 48 to 72 hours. All right, so moving on to strains. Again, we have microscopic muscle tears. During my assessment, subjectively, the patient's going to complain of sudden severe pain. Uh, also, complaints of soreness, stiffness, tenderness. Objective data, uh, I'm going to observe for stiffness, uh, ecchymosis, and edema at the injury site. Diagnostic tests, of course, they're going to do x-rays. Medical management, surgery, if the muscle is completely ruptured, analgesics, muscle relaxants. Nursing interventions, ice, okay, ice to relieve pain. Uh, back strains are the most common type of strain. If symptoms worsen, instruct the patient to avoid strenuous activities. Use a firm chair with uh, good back support. Uh, women need to avoid high heels. Use of a firm mattress and avoid sleeping on their abdomen. And also encourage leg exercises to prevent thrombosis because they're going to be off their feet for a while. Okay, moving on to dislocations. Dislocations. When you think about a dislocation, this is just a temporary displacement of bone from within the joint. Okay, so that's all a dislocation is. It's just a temporary displacement of bone from within the joint. Some examples, uh, the humerus can dislocate from the scapula. Okay, so that, that is just an example. So what are my clinical manifestations if my patient has a dislocation? Uh, dislocations may or may not be visible. Uh, patients going to complain of pain. Uh, we'll see, might see changes in the length of the extremity. It is actually shorter. Loss of function. And then partially uh, immobilization of the joint. So it's going to be immobilized. They're, they're not going to want to move it. Some common places that we see dislocations are the shoulder, uh, hip, knee, places like that. During my assessment subjectively, I'm going to include the patient's description of their injury, their pain, uh, if they have sensation loss, if they're experiencing paresthesia, which is the numbness and tingling. Objective data, I'm going to assess for erythema, discoloration, edema, pain, tenderness, limited movement. I'm going to look for a deformity with that extremity shortening. Uh, compare both sides to validate that you have that shortening of the extremity. Make sure you do your neurovascular assessment, okay? Assessing your P's that we talked about for vascular and nerve injury. Uh, with shoulder dislocation, uh, sometimes the radial pulse is absent, okay? The hand may feel hypothermic. Uh, you might see wrist drop occur with the patient. Diagnostic tests, 
diagnosis is based on complaints of discomfort, uh, the physical exam, and of course, x-rays. Medical management, uh, they may have to do closed reduction, okay? So closed reduction means uh, there's not gonna be any type of surgery or incision that's needed to correct the deformity. So closed reduction means uh, medical management wise that uh, you would see the use of a sling, uh, possibly splinting as well. Um, now sometimes worst case scenario, surgical intervention is necessary, but a lot of the times they could just use slings and splinting. Nursing interventions, reduce edema and discomfort. Uh, immobilization is very important to promote healing. Ice application, first 24 hours. After 24 hours, uh, heat may be used if there is no bleeding present. Um, elevation of the extremity on pillows. Uh, apply elastic bandaging for edema. When splints, slings, or elastic bandages are used, make sure you're performing your neurovascular assessments frequently. That's very important to do. Um, analgesics, okay, always make sure you have your patient rate their pain on a scale of zero to 10. Uh, positioning, repositioning, that helps with discomfort. And then sometimes uh, you will see uh, an air cast or an air splint brace that is used for immobilization. Okay, it's just, it's inflatable and it conforms to the extremity. So that is uh, what we refer to as an air cast or an air splint brace. So you have some patient problems to make sure that you look over um, in your green box, compromised peripheral tissue perfusion related to injury and treatment. Make sure you read through that. And then potential for harm or damage to the body related to neurovascular impairment. Again, like I said, there's never a time when you should not be reading information in boxes. So make sure you read over your patient problems and the nursing interventions. Okay, moving on to the last thing here with traumatic injuries that we're going to address, um, airbag injuries. Okay, with airbag injuries, uh, you, a patient can sustain anything uh, from chemical burns, ocular trauma, uh, cervical injuries, soft tissue injury, uh, trauma to the upper extremities and the chest area is common. Orthopedic injuries uh, can also occur to like the wrist, the hands, the elbow. Now injuries can be life-threatening in the very young and older adults. So again, injuries can be life-threatening in the very young and older adults. So that's who we worry about the most, sustaining a life-threatening injury is the very young and the very old. Uh, treatment for airbag injuries include uh, wound assessment and cleaning, uh, ice application, and of course, analgesic.